thank you very much. I'm glad to be back here at LACMA, which is one of the finest places to join here in Los Angeles, which is my all-time favorite city in the world. Because, and I, I can you tell you why I moved here, because my wife and I had to decide where to move in the United States, and we said, we move to the city with the most substance. You have to look beyond the glitz and glamour of Hollywood, uh, and then you will understand. So I'm at a good place, and I'm glad to be back here at LACMA. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining us for this conversation. Um, ever, I was wondering, how, how many times have you seen this film? Um, I have seen it uh, in New York at the Tribeca Film Festival, and now I wanted to sit through with an audience <clears throat> because I would like to report to Mikhail Sergeyevich uh, Gorbachev your reaction here in the house. Uh, I think he will like uh, what I have to tell him. <clears throat> Thank you. I shall let him know. This is for him, not for me. Very, very kind. I think he'll certainly like hearing, hearing that. There was, um, uh, last week, uh, there was a big a screening of the film uh, <clears throat> and Andrei Singer was there in Moscow. It was a closing film of the Moscow Film Festival and there was a huge crowd, so, so big that they had uh, to deny access to many that were lined up and couldn't get in. And apparently some very warm applause for Mikhail Sergeyevich as well. He himself could not attend the screening uh, because he's in hospital right now. Has he seen the film? <clears throat> he has seen the film about half a year ago, uh, and also with audience, and he uh, just took his intravenous needles out of his hand and uh, left the baffled uh, medical doctors behind, jumped into a car and came to the screening. <laughs> and. Uh, and uh, he uh, apparently liked the film very much. He said, uh, by far the best film that was ever made on him. But I have to, now I have to point out, you have seen some footage in the film by a colleague of mine, uh, <coughs> Vitaly Mansky. And uh, for example, when he meets his old aunt, and, and this is heartbreakingly beautiful, and this, I must say I'm very grateful that uh, I was allowed to use this footage from uh, made created by Vitali Mansky. It, it is simply filmmaking at its very best. <clears throat> and you had also used um, some other uh, footage from a Mansky film Pardon? as well. You had used um, some other footage from a Mansky film as well. Too. Yes, uh, when he's at the cemetery. But I, I wanted to specially point it out at, uh, at its very best moments so that it st stays better in the memory of the audience. Um, so I, I, I owe him, I owe him a lot. Uh, one of the things I, I know you've said before is that you don't, you're not a journalist, you're a poet. Um, and with this, I think you really capture who, a facet of Gorbachev as a man, and in terms of um, him being on the verge of the possible and the impossible. I'm curious to think, or to know what you think a bit about his, if his future that you had said, sort of the tragedy of, of him, if 
the future of the Soviet Union or um, even with connecting with Europe, if that is something that would have been possible? I think it is still possible, but uh, of course, uh, to answer your first hint is, uh, yes, I, I try to not only portray him and his time, I wanted to look at some moments attempted at least to look into his soul. And at the end when I'm repeating the poem by Lermontov, uh, it, it is something like, almost like looking, uh, catching a glimpse of the soul of his country, of Russia. A very deep, wonderful soul. So <clears throat> that was uh, one thing that I attempted. And of course, uh, the film hints, and, and you as an audience, understood and captured it. There were wonderful times where the unthinkable became possible and were doable. The most improbable characters, Ronald Reagan and Gorbachev, meet and they uh, uh, trigger momentous changes in world history. And uh, I do believe that the demonization of Russia is a very major mistake, not only of the media but of politics. And it would be good if somehow uh, we would depart from, from, from this uh, entering into a phase of an almost new version of the Cold War. But of course, uh, today, it's when, when you look at the media, for example, um, today, I think it is not that important what the facts are telling us. It's more who owns the narrative. And in a way, the narrative is completely occupied by uh, demonizing uh, Russia. And I do not believe that Russia really poses a danger for the West. They are not going to attack. They are not going to attack America. And dangers are enough out there in the world and, and they, these dangerous uh, situations in countries and schemes are raising their heads and we can see them emerging. The real danger is not Russia, in my personal opinion. And uh, just given also your history, which I know we were speaking a bit before about you spending time in Russia and even with this film, um, I'm curious to know maybe your perceptions of what maybe their narrative is of the US or the West? Um, I think there's a certain amount of disappointment uh, that, uh, for example, as strange as it may sound, Vladimir Putin um, had seriously contemplated and asked for having uh, Russia um, admitted as member of NATO, of all things. It has not been reported widely, but of course, uh, of course, it, it, it is an undoable idea because NATO would not defend Russia's border in the Far East against a potential war with China, for example. So, but um, I think uh, Russia uh, also, and it's an, an omnipresent, almost omnipresent feeling of uh, encroachment and existentially threatened by the expansion of NATO. And uh, it was promised to Gorbachev, and we can see the documents today, NATO would not expand when Germany reunited. East Germany would not uh, be weaponized. It would not uh, be a, a, an offensive form of expansionism, of military expansionism. And uh, not only the leadership in Russia right now feels threatened. It is the population itself. A majority of Russians feel existentially threatened by the expansion of NATO. And if you allow me a, 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 a metaphorical scenario, if, let's say, <clears throat> NATO, NATO had dissolved and the Warsaw Pact had uh, continued with a promise not to expand. And all of a sudden, the Warsaw Pact would uh, somehow incorporate Canada. And Russian troops, 200,000 Russian troops, uh, 
conducting military maneuvers together with the Canadians at the North American border. It would freak out America. And at the same time, let's say a few aircraft carriers stationed near Tijuana, <clears throat> some 20, 30, 40,000 Russian troops in Jamaica smoking weed <laughs> with, a, with the guys there. <laughs> and and uh, so I, I think Russia would feel, uh, sorry, America would feel existentially threatened. And you have seen it during the Cuba crisis that was an existential threat and, and America responded. I'm also curious too, I mean, there's some hints in, in this film about this, but um, maybe even the relationship between Gorbachev and Putin and maybe how they view each other. Well, he did not want to uh, comment on Vladimir Putin. He comments a little bit on Yeltsin. Uh, what I know, uh, and I can tell you that without any problem, both seem to respect each other. Uh, they do have, and, and Gorbachev of course has uh, fundamental uh, differences in opinion, but ultimately they respect each other. And uh, Vladimir Putin, knowing that uh, there might be a personal threat against Gorbachev being considered among some ultras uh, in uh, Russia as being a traitor. He doesn't want him to see him assassinated or so. And I think, I do believe that some of the bodyguards that Gorbachev uh, has around him are the best of the best, the, the, the toughest of the guerrillas that Putin delegated to protect him. Um, one question I did have to ask, especially after watching this uh, a few times, there was a lot of detail in the, uh, the Austrian news story about the slugs. I, sure, yes. I, was, I was curious about where that came from. And, uh, well, where does this come from? At that time I lived in Austria. And, uh, and it was the evening news and I was not really attentive all of a sudden. Uh, I, I see this because I had read it in, in some uh, news tickers. Uh, the uh, Iron Curtain has been lifted. I, I mean, a s symbolic gesture, uh, but of m monumental consequence. An entire epoch coming to an end. And I see the Austrian news and, and I was bolt upright and I, I said to myself, do I see what I see? Do I really see what I see? And, and I, I, I was stunned. And then under miscellaneous comes the barbed wire. And uh, when we uh, edited the film, I, I asked Andre Singer and his team of researchers and archivists, um, I said to them, I remember this, find it, please, please, please find it. It must still exist and it still exists and I, I put it in the, I, I just had no choice, I had to. It's too good not to, yes. Yeah. When, when, it comes to, when it comes to media as good as that, you gotta, you gotta give them space. Um, and also going off of that too, I'm curious, um, given all your collaborations that you have done with Andre Singer before, this is the first time that you've co-directed a film with him. Um, can you talk a little bit about the process that you guys had with this? I mean, you obviously yes. had a rapport, but... Well, uh, very easy sort of working order. I did not know that Andre Singer had uh, talked to a German, former East German TV station, now uh, Federal Re Republic of Germany, Mitteldeutscher Rundfunk. And they <clears throat> contemplated a couple of projects and they didn't come to any gra common ground and then uh, it, there was all of a sudden the, the idea, why not doing something about Gorbachev? And Andre said immediately, yes, let's move forward. And only when uh, uh, Gorbachev's entourage and Gorbachev himself had agreed in principle, yes, then all of a sudden uh, Andre called me and he said, I'm planning to do this, but, but I, I feel at a loss, you have to step in, please do the conversations. And I said, I have no problem to do that. Sure, 
I like Gorbachev for his role in the, in the reunification of Germany. Uh, but then I grew into the project more and more, and we collaborated very easily. Uh, we made common mistakes. Both he and I had a different um, sort of perspective in mind, pointing out to much more common ground that Mikhail Gorbachev and me as a German actually had. We had a similar childhood, uh, knowing, uh, growing up in ruins. Um, knowing what hunger was, growing up in a house that had no running water, no electricity, and things like that. So, and we had a first uh, edit uh, which was done in London, and I flew into London and I saw it, and my my heart sank, and Andre's heart sank. We knew that was a mistake. I play a very, very. I, I have to be the person to ask the question. I personally and my background are totally and utterly irrelevant, with one exception that I had traveled on foot around my country because Gorbachev had traveled on foot a lot and had understood the world and his society and the people through traveling on foot. It was the only thing where, where there is something uh, we mention now in the film. So we committed a similar mistake together and immediately saw there was something not right. And we immediately recalibrated the entire film into a, into a much better direction. How much research did you do uh, before? How much research did you do before? Um, uh, well, speaking? I tried to do my homework. Sure, I read uh, uh, Gorbachev memoirs, and I read a lot of uh, documents. I even read uh, some uh, documents uh, that were um, uh, now in archives, open uh, discussions in the Supreme Soviet under Brezhnev and even before Brezhnev. And now you have full transcripts of it and you have for some key uh, moments in Soviet Union's history, I read about, uh, I read uh, direct transcripts of uh, discussions in the Politburo and strangely enough, sometimes there are two different versions depending on who scribbled them down, uh, whether it was an undrop of uh, a follower or a uh, follower of Janjenko or of Gromyko. So it's <clears throat> very interesting to find and figure out this kind of labyrinthic uh, thinking and procedures within the Politburo and within the elite of the leadership in the Kremlin. So I've, I've seen some very good stuff. And um, <clears throat> I have uh, seen some, some of the more important works on, on Gorbachev. Um, so uh, I, I've done my homework, strangely enough, Gorbachev also did his homework. When we met first, he had a stack of paper as thick as this, and he started to talk about my films and about my childhood. And I said, I said, Mikhail Sergeyevich, can we stop it right here? We have a camera waiting, and I know we shouldn't waste our time in, in talking about my childhood. And apparently, apparently he had seen one or two of my films. He, we, we, I refused to discuss my films. <laughs> and uh, can you talk a little bit too about um, with filming this? I know you filmed this over three meetings with him, correct? Um, there were actually two meetings two. settled, uh, and uh, then out of the blue, he literally summoned me back to come to Moscow. We have to talk again. And I said, uh, but Mikhail Sergeyevich, we have agreed after two long sessions, one and a half hour each. Uh, that we covered all ground <clears throat> needed. And he said, no, you have to come back. He somehow took a liking in me, and in a way he signaled to us uh, that he would not be willing to talk to any media again in his life. So in understanding that, of course, I, uh, I immediately went to Moscow and had a third meeting. And in this third meeting, <clears throat> we handed him over the chocolates, and in this third meeting, uh, he 
recites a poem, which I repeat in a scroll at the end. So all of a sudden, something less formal, uh, much deeper, uh, touching his soul and the soul of Russia emerged. I think also going off of that too, you see in um, some of the footage, I don't want to say it's a performance from him, but there is definitely, he knows how to say certain things to um, get a certain reaction, but as it sort of goes through, specifically I think once you sort of tap into his loneliness, you do see something. Um, I don't know if it's necessarily so much like a sadness of him also, not just having his wife, but also lacking a lot of sort of the contemporaries of someone of like that echelon in terms of history, um, especially in terms of like the Kairos that you were talking about before. And there's also something about this film and I think your conversations with him that also feel very much of the moment. And I think even outside of just sort of the US and Russia and what's going on in the news. And I'm curious what you think maybe this moment might be specifically in terms of reflecting back on his life and maybe any lessons that we can learn going forward. Yes, I, I do believe, and, and there is some. There is no message in the film, but yeah. but there is some sort of a of a climate or a distant echo. Uh, when we look back at uh, Reagan and him, the most unlikely characters all of a sudden speak and they negotiate, and and these moments are possible. These moments are possible, no matter what you personally may believe and think about uh, Trump, um, about Donald Trump, uh, the fact that he talks and negotiates with North Korea, the most unlikely characters ever put together in one room, King Jong-un uh, and Ronald, uh, sorry, <laughs> Don, <laughs> Donald Trump. And uh, there was, like in the first meetings, Gorbachev, Reagan, no direct treaty or, or result, it may not uh, bring any result at all, we don't know. But I think um, it's this attitude, let's look beyond the horizon, something that Gorbachev hammered into the Americans, it was not a failure. And uh, now <clears throat> talking to North Korea has already re diffused, for the moment at least, a very dangerous situation. And uh, these, the possibilities are always out there. And I welcome, I personally welcome uh, this kind of, of uh, bold moves to, to talk to the enemy. Talk to them. I think in closing, I wanted to uh, ask you what you have, what's next on deck? Well, what's next? I, I already finished two more films. Uh, one of them uh, about Bruce Chatwin, it's called Nomad, in the footsteps of Bruce Chatwin, which I did for the BBC, uh, had its world premiere at the Tribeca Film Festival on Sunday, and I couldn't even attend my own world premiere because I have yet another film, a feature film, a narrative feature film I shot in Japan with Japanese actors in Japanese language, which crazily enough was officially selected by the Cannes Film Festival. So <laughs> it's, well, it, is, uh, it is out of competition, but it means a lot to me that out of the blue after 25 years of neglecting my films, Khan all of a sudden comes back. Uh, I had some films before at the festival, so I've, I've had my share. But uh, I'm scrambling at the moment to get French subtitles and get a DCP and a press kit and a poster and uh, you just name it. Uh, it's, uh, I, I'm caught in an avalanche that I'm sitting here is not even right because I should check, I should check into the French subtitles. Well, thank you so much for your work and thank you for showing your film with us this evening. Thank you, thank you.
Thank you. Thank you and good night.